44. Total victory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 26. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. In verse 20, Paul sets forth the triumphant proclamation of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Modern man has cheapened the power of language by his loose views of the meaning of resurrection. In the Greco-Roman world, beliefs in immortality were commonplace, that is, of the soul surviving the body's death to live on as a spirit. The major exception to this was the Egyptian view of life after death, but this was an anemic view when compared with the doctrine of the resurrection, and it was tied to a works religion. Not only did Jesus Christ rise again physically from the dead in a glorified body, but he became the firstfruits of them that slept, Verse 20. The departed saints waited for their bodily resurrection at the end of time and history, but Jesus Christ, by his bodily resurrection, was the first fruits, an advance witness to the great and general resurrection. That great final event of history would signal the total triumph of the triune God over all his enemies. It would openly display the end of history as the triumph over the powers of sin and death. These two marks of the fall would be corrected by Christ's atonement and its power. Christ would replace the work of the enemy in the lawbreaker, Genesis chapter 3 verse 5, with his perfect law-keeping and atonement. There would be life instead of death in the portion of Christ's new human race as the last Adam, and righteousness or law-keeping would replace sin. The history of man culminates in the triumph of God. God, however, triumphs in and through his creature, man. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Verse 21. Man and his history are the battlegrounds. The battle will end where it began, in man and his obedience to God. Only the last Adam is the God-man, Jesus Christ. God in Jesus knows and experiences without sin the full extent of man's life. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Verse 22 As Christ in his incarnation triumphs over sin and death, so too shall we his new human race. The resurrection is thus an important event in human history because it sets forth the destiny of all men in Christ. There is, however, a time gap in this great event. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. Verse 23 Between Christ's resurrection and the general resurrection, there is a great time lapse. The redeemed, the people of the resurrection, must first perform a great task, the conquest of all men, nations and things for Jesus Christ, bringing them under his law and into his kingdom. Christ's victory is indeed also our victory, but his battle, his holy warfare against sin and death, is also our battle. With our triumph in Christ, or sometime thereafter, comes the end of history in the endless and eternal reign of Jesus Christ. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Verse 24 The conquest on earth is now complete. The new and regenerate humanity of Christ has triumphed over the old and fallen humanity of Adam. 
Christ does not surrender the kingdom, but rather delivers it to God as an accomplished conquest. All alien or enemy rule, authority and power are put down. They are finally defeated, so that all things are again totally under God and his authority. Christ's present reign is as a warrior king over an army raised up to wage war against all the enemies of God. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Verse 25 The battlefield is history, the created realm, and this is the area in all history for reconquest and victory. Some views of millennialism see the victory as God's supernatural work, and this denies the meaning of the Incarnation and the Resurrection. It says, in effect, that Christ's new human race has no part in the victory. This Paul does not allow. Christ's victory means that we apply the victory to every area of life and thought. Christ's reign as battle king continues until all his enemies are put under his feet. This is the church's battle. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Verse 26 Death is described not only as the enemy of man, but as the final, the last enemy. Death is man's enemy, not God's, although it comes to negate God's great gift, life. It is by the gift of life that man most clearly resembles God, and by his ability to pass on life to his progeny, But this gift is now negated, denied by the fall. Very early in Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, we see that both man the creature and also his tempter recognize that any departure from God is a departure from life. Although the tempter implies that this is not a certain departure from life, but a problematical one. Thou shalt not surely die. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. A problematical word means an as yet problematical and untested power may reclaim sovereignty and total power, but the tempter implies that this is an as yet untested power. Paul allows no such question. The self-revelation of God in his word is total and complete, and therefore so too is his victory. In the destruction of death, God destroys every last enemy of man and God. This final destruction occurs in two events, Christ's resurrection and our general resurrection. Total victory thus prevails over sin and death in a new creation. Christ's total victory becomes ours also.